Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Section 11 of David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding is titled of Providence and a Future State. And he is going to discuss both of those in the course of this section, probably much more about providence. And when we hear that term, we should bring to mind the idea of a deliberate and thoughtful arrangement of matters within the universe that concern us, that concern everything else within the universe. When we talk about providential ordering, we're meaning that there's some sort of uh, purpose of uh, arrangement of things so that things work together well, right? So we can talk about there being order or structure or fitness, we might even say, within the universe. And then we can also talk about other things like, does justice exist within this world? Is it a fair world? That's also a matter of providence. And then the future state issue would come in. If the world itself isn't fair enough and we've got a God, well, then God would you know, take care of all of our merits or demerits later on. We're not going to worry so much about that right now because there's some key issues that we need to explore as David Hume is setting the stage for us. And this is a particularly interesting section from a rhetorical perspective. One of the tricks that Hume often does is when he's, he's attacking religion and, you know, a sort of philosophy oriented around religion, which is quite common in his time, he will, instead of saying, here's the arguments against it, uh, this is exactly what I believe. He will say, you know, uh, somebody might say this sort of thing. And of course, I don't buy into this myself, but let's take a look at their arguments anyway. And we see Hume doing this in, in a number of different places. And he's doing that here in this work. He says at the beginning, I was engaged in conversation with a friend who loves skeptical paradoxes. He advanced many principles, which I by no means approve. Yet as they seem to be curious and bear some relation to the chain of reasoning carried on in this inquiry, I'll copy them from my memory as accurately as I can in order to submit them to the judgment of the reader. So I'm going to put forth what my friend had to say, and now it's going to get even more convoluted because his, uh, you know, they're, they're talking about the good fortune of philosophy, and then they're talking about, uh, you know, its connection with leisure and freedom, and they're talking about Athens, uh, you know, other than the banishment of Protagoras and the death of Socrates, you know, Athens was, was a pretty good place. Epicurus lived at Athens to an advanced age in peace and tranquility. And Epicureans were even allowed, even though they had rather heterodox beliefs about things, to participate in the religious framework of that society and even in the Roman Empire. And so his friend says, you admire the singular, as the singular good fortune of philosophy, which seems to result from the natural course of things and be unavoidable in every age and nation. You know, um, philosophy itself is often responsible for the pertinacious bigotry, which uh, seems to be fatal to philosophy. What if Epicurus was persecuted? What if he had to give an accounting for himself the way that Socrates did? And if you think back to the trial of Socrates, what was he actually on trial for? Corruption of the young, but also for impiety. That is holding heterodox religious beliefs about the nature of uh, the gods and the universe. 
What would Epicurus say if he was going to defend his own point of view about religion? And we should mention that the Epicureans didn't actually believe that gods don't exist. They, in fact, thought there were gods, but those gods have zero connection with human life. That is why the gods are actually happy, blessed, untroubled. They don't get involved in human affairs or the running of the universe. So you could say that, you know, practically speaking, what are these? Are these remotely like the gods that typical religious people think about? No. So this could be a kind of practical atheism. In any case, Epicurus, right, is giving this speech and he's talking about the religious philosophers. Um, you know, he's going to address not the ordinary people, but those who, you know, can be reasoned with. And so he says that uh, we're not going to dispute concerning the origin and government of worlds. The religious philosophers, not satisfied with the tradition of your forefathers and doctrine of your priests, indulge a rash curiosity in trying to see how far they can establish religion on the principles of reason. So they're trying to sort of have a, their cake and eat it too, to use that old expression. They want to have the doctrines about the gods, including that you know, the gods take care of the world or God does, but they also want to establish this using argument and reason. And you could say, you know, looking at the universe in an empirical way. So they think that within the universe, we can in fact, discern some sort of divine providence. So they, they paint in the most magnificent colors, the order, beauty, and wise arrangement of the universe. And then they ask if such a glorious display of intelligence could proceed from the fortuitous concourse of atoms, or if chance could produce what the greatest genius cannot sufficiently admire. Now, why are they talking about atoms? Well, the Epicureans were atomists, and they thought that everything really is atoms and their interactions, and there is some randomness that allows us you know, freedom. Uh, this is their metaphysics. And so these people are saying Epicurean metaphysics doesn't work. Look at the universe. You can see how wonderfully arranged it is. Must be that there are gods or God. And so he calls this uh, the main or the chief or sole argument for a divine existence derived from what? The order of nature. What do you see in nature? He says, there appear marks of intelligence and design that you think it extravagant to assign for its cause, either chance or the blind and unguided force of matter. And what is going on here if we think about it in a very generic sense? From a human perspective and the perspective that is being given to Epicurus, what these people are doing is looking at effects things that, that occur and saying there must be a cause for these effects. And the effects are not just the singular things, but the way that they're arranged together, the way that they're fitted together in some sort of ordering that seems to make sense. Therefore, there must be a cause that produced this. So they're inferring the cause from the effect. Now, when when do we do this? Sometimes we infer causes from effects that we understand the relation between quite well, you know, constant conjunction, right? In this case, we've got the cause only known from its effects. So we're, it's not like a case of where there's smoke, there's fire. This is more where there's arrangement in the universe. There must be a God as the cause of that. How much could we possibly know about this cause, he says. Um, from the order of the work, you infer there must have been project and forethought in the work person. If you cannot make this out, you allow your conclusion fails. And so Hume has his, his character say, when we infer any particular cause from an effect, we must proportion the one to the other. And we can never be allowed to ascribe to any cause qualities, but what are exactly sufficient to produce the effect. And he gives the example of like bodies and stuff like that. And so he says this same rule 
what is the rule? We cannot ascribe to it further qualities or assume it uh, capable of producing other effects because we don't actually know. The same rule holds whether the cause assigned be brute unconscious matter or a rational intelligent being. If the cause, he says, be known only for, by the effect, we ought never to ascribe to it qualities beyond what are precisely requisite to produce the effect, nor can we, by any just rules of reasoning, return back from the cause and infer other effects from it. So what is the upshot of this? Well, we, if we want to say that there's gods or a god that produced this you know, order in the universe, we can only infer that the gods have the qualities that we see reflected in their works. That's all we can know about them because we're, we're just relying on, you know, our observation and on reason, right? So he says that, um, you know, if we think about uh, Zauxis, who is a, a great artist in ancient Greece, I mean, was Epicurus talking to Athenians, he says, nobody merely from the sight of one of Zauxis's pictures could know that he was also a statuary or architect and was an artist no less skillful in stone and marble than in colors. The talents and taste displayed in the particular work before us, these we may safely conclude the workmen to be possessed of. The cause must be proportioned to the effect. So he says, if we allow the gods to be authors of the existence or order of the universe, it follows, here's what we can actually say about them. They possess that precise degree of power, intelligence, and benevolence, which appears in their workmanship. Nothing further can be proved, he says, unless we bring in some other things, you know, like as he says, flattery and exaggeration to supply the defects of argument and reasoning. And he's going to talk about all sorts of other smuggling in assumptions. If we're just going with observation and experience, all we can say about the gods as workmen of this world or God as the creator of the world is what we can infer from the world itself, the world that we observe. So, you know, how much can we actually infer about this world? I mean, does it appear to be all that well organized, you know, perfectly uh, suited? Everything is connected to everything else. You know, he, he'll say at some point, um, think, think about all the fruitless industry to account for the ill appearances of nature and save the honor of the gods. While we must acknowledge the reality of the evil and disorder, which the world so much abounds. And people might make up excuses for this. He brings up the obstinate and intractable qualities of matter or the observance of general laws, right? This is why Jupiter, you know, uh, God, uh, obliged him to create mankind and every sensible creature so imperfect and so unhappy. Now, notice what he's doing there. If we can only infer things about the cause from the effects and the universe isn't actually this harmonious, perfect, uh, well-arranged thing, but is actually kind of a mess, what can we infer? Oh, that there's a perfect designer behind it? Maybe not. Maybe this actually proves that if there is a God, that God is not a particularly great or attentive or thoughtful workmen, right? So that's, that's kind of a, a problem here. Um, we, we infer the qualities of, of the deity in, in its works, right? He also is, is stressing here that, listen, we can't legitimately look at just the effects, reason to the cause, and then descend back from the cause in inferences to the effect. So we can't like look at the universe and say, well, it seems like it's a mess, but you know, insofar as it's got order, there must be a, like a great designer who is, you know, providentially thinking about all this. And therefore there must in fact be order that we're not discerning in it. Hume would say that's, you know, you can believe that if you want, but you don't have good rational reasons for that. Right. And, uh, this is, this is going to be kind of a problem. He goes on and he says, the religious hypothesis must be considered only 
as a particular method of accounting for the visible phenomena of the universe. So what does that mean? It's only one of several different possibilities for explaining what it is that we actually observe in the universe. We could also explain it on the basis of atoms or chance or pick whatever else you might want. He says, no just reasoner will ever, ever presume to infer it from any single fact and alter or add to the phenomena in any single particular, right? So, you know, he says, where then is the hatefulness, the odiousness of the doctrine which I teach in my school? You know, where, where are you seeing a problem with this? I deny a providence, you say, and supreme governor of the world who guides the course of events and punishes the vicious, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to get into that more in a different discussion. But the point here is that there's alternative explanations, right? And then Hume actually considers a possible objection after this nice speech by uh, Epicurus that's uh, discussed here. Um, and he says, and this is, you know, probably familiar to many of us. Uh, I observe, said I, finishing, he'd finished, he'd, he'd finished his harangue, that you neglect not the artifice of the demagogues of old. You know, you're making rhetorical arguments. But let me propose this. If you saw a half-finished building surrounded with heaps of brick and stone and mortar and all the instruments of masonry, could you not infer from the effect that it was a work of design and contrivance? That is an interesting uh, sort of analogy here, right? Because why is Hume using this? I mean, the next thing that he's going to say is the very familiar uh, one about if you saw on the seashore the print of one human foot, you would conclude that a man had passed that way and that he'd also left the traces of the other foot. Now, that's sort of saying, well, you know, we see some effects, we reason to the causes. So, you know, it's a familiar argument from design. But this is an argument from design that takes into account the fact that the universe does seem to be kind of a mess, right? We see a half finished building, a building that's, you know, good in some parts, not good in other parts. And then we see like the raw materials scattered around or perhaps not even scattered, maybe piled around. And we can say, ah, this one isn't quite done, but it's clearly the work of an intelligent designer, right? So we've got this argument from design that's you know, very familiar to many people in the philosophy of religion. He says that, you know, if you see something that looks like design effect, you can infer the designer as a, a uh, cause. And then the question is, does this actually allow us to say that there is indeed a designer? And here Hume is going to bring out one of his favorite arguments that he makes in other places. So this objection is actually handled by the fact that there is such a big difference between human matters. We can rightly judge that there's human intentionality and design there and whatever it is that the deity or the divinity is and the universe. So he says that the infinite difference of the subjects is a sufficient foundation for this difference in my conclusions. This is his friend talking. In works of human art and contrivance, it is allowable to advance from the effect to the cause and returning back from the cause to form new inferences concerning the effects. Why? Well, because we know a lot about human beings from experience. So we can go back and forth between causes and effects like that, right? So he says that uh, we know that people from experience, the motives and designs we're acquainted with, whose projects and inclinations have a certain connection and coherence according to the laws which nature has established for the government of such a creature. But what about God? We don't actually know anything about God. He says the deity is known to us only by his productions. We go back to this. You cannot go uh, further than inferring the cause from the effects and the, uh, you can only infer in the cause what actually shows up in the effects. So he says the, the deity is only known by his productions 
even more, is a single being in the universe not comprehended under any species or genus. Now, this is not a radically new doctrine. Thomas Aquinas actually says stuff like this. So do other people uh, in the history of Christianity. So this is taking religious philosophy and saying, well, the conclusions that must follow from this are, you know, not what you would expect, right? So there's an infinite difference between the subjects of the human beings, plural, versus God. He says the print of you know, uh, a foot in the sand. Yeah, that works just fine. But we can't refer to, we can't look at the universe and then automatically infer attributes or qualities in God. He says, as the universe shows wisdom and goodness, we infer wisdom and goodness. As it shows a particular degree of these perfections, we infer that particular degree. But further attributes, we can never be authorized to infer or suppose by any rules of just reasoning. We can't go any further. So uh, the analogies, Hume points out that we are relying on analogy. The analogies that would have to do with the divine being are incredibly arbitrary and weak. We cannot tell much about uh, divinity on the basis of what we observe in the universe. Now, as I pointed out, all of this is being attributed either to his friend or to Epicurus. Hume says, oh, I'm not saying this myself, but this is in fact Hume's doctrine. We cannot legitimately, rationally infer anything you know, that we would, we would have great confidence in about there being an intelligent designer by looking merely at the universe. We can... We can have faith in that if we want to. We can engage in imagination and fancy. We can allow ourselves to be convinced by other people's hearsay. But we don't have any good rational grounds, according to Hume, to think that the, the universe is, in fact, providentially ordered or arranged.